Chicago, but originally from Maryland and Munster. Uh, we are not currently investors, but here to learn and network and hopefully be able to become investors very soon. Mm -hmm. Back there, a couple up here. 
Hi, my name is Tim Higgins. Um, I'm uh, from Porter County. I have a few uh, rental properties in Porter County. I'm also a plumbing contractor. I just want to kind of network and uh, maybe grow and do some flips. You got the whole back row with Mahala and. I know, they're trying to hide. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Mahela Raikou. I invest in Northwest Indiana um, from rentals to tax sales to development, new land and new construction. Hi, I'm Amy Ficus. I'm a property manager and flipping houses at the time also, and do my properties in the board. I'm Alicia Ortiz at Portage, Indiana. I do buy and hold mainly in the Notre Dame area, and I also buy notes. Michael Jostin from Chesterton area. Just getting started in, uh, in real estate investing, but also really interested in uh, retirement planning as well. Anyone else want to say hi? hi. All the way in the back. <clears throat> I am Tim Carlson. Uh, I'm a roofer by trade, and I've been flipping houses with my dad as far as working on them. Well, we appreciate all the guests coming. Um, just real quick, it seems like guests come from one of three places. Who heard about the group on Facebook? All right, that's about a third. We've had some issues. Facebook just changed how they do all their marketing, so like the ads we promote, half of it you can't do anymore. So we're trying to figure that out. Craigslist? Nobody from Craigslist. Okay, that's great to know. I will stop wasting my time posting there. Um, a site like Bigger Pockets, Connected Investors, a couple there. And then what's everybody else? Friend referral? An e blast, yes. I did e blast at Agents. Cool. Awesome. Um, who did a deal in the past month? Bought something, wholesaled something, loaned some money, closed on a flip? Justin, you're my mic guy. I'm going to fire you and put John on. I know, I'm doing terrible. <laughs> I bought a four unit building in Valparaiso. Nice. Keeping it, <coughs> flipping it? Keeping it. Was that on market, off market? How did you find it? Through a realtor before it went to market. Okay. Those are the best. Anyone else knew anything fun? Nick did something. Nick cut my grass. Another my grass. grass. And then the rental of the contract should close next Tuesday. So. Well, hopefully Thursday I, uh, I'm closing on a deal. I bought this rental probably about two and a half years ago. It was a vacant house. The owner thought that they lost it or something. And um, what happens in South Village is sometimes they release the loan so that they don't have to foreclose on them. There was a couple houses down from the rent of the line, so I went to the owner. I tracked down the owner. I'm like, you want to sell your house? I see it's vacant. Like, don't ever call me again. I'm like, okay. So then I called him six months later and I'm like, all right, you're responsible for this house. This house is still in your name. I'm like, what do you want to do? She's like, well, you want to buy it off? I'm like, yeah. She's like, how much? I'm like, $500. And then uh, she owed probably about three or four thousand in back taxes, so I bought an offer for five hundred, and then uh, probably put about twenty thousand into it and rented it out for thirteen. I netted like a thousand a month, for, and then uh, I had had it sold for about fifty-seven. That's a pretty good return. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Anyone else do anything? Did you just get that license, or do you have that? I just got to Indiana, and I actually okay. just started working with a couple of clients looking for a home, and I finished my rehab and, uh, on the south side, and we got a business, so trying cool. to get that right for the public. 
and if that's stuff on the market, things are a little bit slower right now. Still good because there's a bunch of Illinois cable companies that we've noticed our days on market are a little bit, a little bit higher. Anyone else want to share something that they did in the past 30 days? I didn't tell Justin, but I told all these people in the email blast around a diet. Um, so to make him run all over the room. He didn't want to talk when I was saying it next to him. I know. Me. Uh, Robert Carlson, I bought a three bedroom slab in uh, Festival area. Just bought it at an auction. So that'll go to a buy and hold investor. Well, Invest in WI, we started in January of 2017. Um, we had 15 people at our first meeting. Uh, we've grown a little bit since then. Um, but our goal was to be the premier investment group in Northwest Indiana. And the idea, our mission statement, was to bring together investors of all different levels. So you heard during the introduction, we have people that are just getting started. We have people that have, know nothing about investing and they want to do learn about it. And then we have people in here that have done millions of dollars of, in deals and revenue. Um, in a short time span, a long time span. Um, so the idea is to bring everybody together, provide relevant education, and a place to grow your personal network. Um, a lot of my network when I got started in investing back in 2015 um, were people that I met at a similar group like this. And those are still relationships that I have today. And they really were a catalyst to kickstarting my business. So the networking at these meetings is huge. When we end at 8.30, we have the room till 9.30. So don't just take off, stick, you know, stick around, talk to some people, grab some cards, grab coffee, donuts at the end. I put on 30 pounds, I'm not joking, when I started investing because I kept going to Dunkin' Donuts with everybody. And those Boston cream were my, you know, Boston cream, and now in the fall, those pumpkin ones, you know, they're bad for me. I have not had a pumpkin donut this fall yet. Um, a couple of benefits of being part of a group, again, just the networking with experienced investors. There's no sense for you to go out and make the mistakes that we've already made. So just pick people's brains, learn from their mistakes, and then avoid them. Education through the monthly speakers, a good place to get connected. We have attorneys that come, uh, contractors, accountants, landlords, a bunch of other people, property managers. You can get deals done. Um, who's done a deal with someone in the group? Bought something, lent something? I had two people in the group uh, call me this month that needed short-term financing, and we were able to finance that. And I only know those people because they come to the group. Um, real quick, here's the disclaimer. I'm tired of reading this word for word every time, so I'll give you 10 seconds to read it, and then I'll summarize it. Good. All right, so here's the summary. Do your own due diligence. Speak with your professional circles before you jump into anything. And then the biggest thing is all investments have risk. You may lose money. So the people that's speaking, they've probably lost money. They've made, you know, taken risk. Um, they've done all their due diligence. Just because they're successful doesn't mean that you will be successful. Um, real quick, if you're not part of the Facebook group page, get on your phone, go and ask to be part of that group. Uh, it's a phenomenal group. We have people in there posting questions two or three times a day. You know, hey, I have this issue with the tenant. What do you suggest I do? Um, I need a contractor in this city that does this. Who do you recommend? Um, it's just a great place again, to grow your network and get help. So anyone can get in that group. We do regulate who's going to post in it. We don't have any solicitations in there. So if you're a private lender with a Gmail account and you want us to drop $5,000 as an application fee, we're probably going to boo you out of the group. But a great place to ask <laughs> questions, and that's where we promote this group and the upcoming speakers. All right, so our success story is Justin. If Justin, if you want to come on up. But real quick, if you have a story, um, and I call it a success story, it doesn't have to be a success story. I know Quest is having a big event. Did you guys already have your freaky October thing? Not yet. It's coming up. I wish I was down in Texas because it sounds like an amazing event to go to. It's like deals that go bad. Um, and deals that go bad, you can learn just as much from those things as from deals that go well. Um, so if you have a deal that you've done, maybe you loan money, some money to somebody and you got it back, you can talk about that a flip, a rental, a multifamily, rate. it could be anything else cool, the, uh, um, the, the assisted living facility, something like that. If you want to share, this is literally an eight to 10 minute spot. And we set it up like they do on the TV shows where you talk about here's what I expected, here was the outcome. Um, and it's actually a little bit more realistic because the TV shows are fake. 
and then one or two things that you learned from it. So um, that goes is your next slide. You know that. Let me get you up here. If you're interested in doing that, just send us an email. We do, you know, usually seven or eight of these a year. So we can get you in next month for that. All right, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Justin Relevant. I'm a wholesaler in the area here. Uh, they asked me to talk about a deal that I did over the summer here. Um, this deal is probably something that you all heard of, but uh, it also wasn't a deal as well. It was uh, The numbers were pretty bad, but um, finally got somebody to close on it. So, Anyways, how a buyer of mine acquired a, po a property for less than $3,200. So this property was in Lake Station. It was a two bed, one bath. Um, a lot of the big ticket items were done, like the roof, uh, vinyl windows, uh, AC, HVAC, water heater. Um, just needed some cosmetics, but the, you'll see the ARV is pretty low in that area. And uh, our purchase price wasn't very attractive. Um, so we didn't really get it at the price point we needed to, to do a cash wholesale. But that was our initial strategy. Um, the seller's main motivation uh, was that he had a non-paying tenant. Uh, he was behind on his mortgage, and he just didn't have time to manage it. So he really just didn't want a mortgage anymore. Uh, so some pictures of the property you can see. Uh, you know, on the outside of it was kind of rough. Uh, you see the new roof. Updated electrical. Uh, you know, they took care of the water heater tank. They got it wrapped. Uh, a new Goodman furnace. <coughs> Interior wasn't really that bad. I mean, you could have just... You know, put a renter in there if you wanted to, or you could have uh, put some money into it to get a little bit higher rates. So, how I found this property was I Googled for dollars. Has anybody done that before? Where you Google on street maps, and you can sometimes get an updated picture. I found this house that was overgrown, had a wheelchair ramp, so I figured maybe that would be a potential seller. So, I mailed them some direct mail. Um, it turns out that her daughter. She didn't want to sell a property, but her daughter had a rental property that she needed to dump. So she passed on my info, and that's how I got this lead. Like I said, the initial strategy was to do a cash flow sale to an investor. Um, we just, you know, build our marketing material, uh, submit it um, to our VFPs on the emails, um, and then you know, pump it out on the social media. Uh, we advertised the deal at this meeting uh, back in July, I believe. Um, and we put a two-hour window in, uh, coordinated with the tenant and the seller to bring some buyers through. <coughs> so the numbers, if it was a rental, perhaps you could get it at seven fifty eight fifty a month. We factored in a 10% vacancy, 8% for maintenance of taxes, which were already capped at 2%. Um, insurance in there, tenant bail, utilities, the numbers looked okay at that point. You know, 12 to 13 percent. Or if you do a quick flip, I don't know if you can see those numbers, they're kind of small. Uh, anyways, total acquisition about 41.5, 21 estimated in repairs and holding fees, uh, total cash in 62.5, maybe you could sell it for 72. Uh, that's a bad number, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no mean on the bottom. Cash flip ROI estimated at 6.4 percent. I don't know too many people that would will, be willing to do that uh, or take the time and cast their team and tackle a flip with those numbers. So it was not a deal. Um, one of the things that you learn in this business is sometimes you just don't have a deal. Um, but you can either do one of two things: you could cancel that ag agreement with the seller, or you could, you know, come up with a creative strategy if that appeals to a buyer. Um, I only had two people show up, um, and the numbers that they offered, they didn't even want to offer it to me because it, was, it would be considered offensive, and I agreed with them. You know, our numbers were not on point. That was a big learning experience for me. I should have been trying to sell this to the end buyer for around $24,000, um, but I wasn't quite ready to quit at that point. So I had one guy interested, but he didn't have any money. <laughs> <clears throat> so we took the property on a subject to. Um, we communicated the risks associated with this to both the admirer and the homeowners. Um, after they were um, 
briefed and educated about how this works. Um, I connected the sellers with the end buyer so that they could coordinate a way for him to pay their mortgage on their behalf. Um, added him to the insurance policy uh, or obtaining the second policy. And just the, uh, the idea of avoiding the red flags that uh, some of you know that could come with a subject to transaction like the on sale clause. Anyway, if you remember, the, uh, the seller was just mostly wanting no more anymore. Uh, they were so stressed out by that um, overhead, and uh, they just, uh, it was tackling their mental ability to cope with life. So, again, you're going to notice that the numbers really still aren't all that great. But somebody was willing to, willing to do it. Um, I, kind of went high on the estimations a little bit, but uh, if he put his total cash in around $24,000 to $25,000, um, the existing mortgage was thirty-eight one ninety-two at the time, he might be able to walk away with four grand. I don't still know anybody who would want to do that, but the difference here in the takeaway is that the cash flip transaction ROI was 6.4%. And by leveraging somebody else's money, his return was 17%. So to conclude, uh, like I said, the profit, profit number really doesn't change, but the ROI more than doubles. Uh, the seller achieved their goal. Uh, no more monthly mortgage payments. Um, and to this day, the uh, end buyer and the homeowner are still working together um, and cooperating just fine. Uh, the buyer acquired the property with little of his own money, and, and that's kind of the boat he was in at the time. He didn't have any money to purchase uh, a, cash, a cash property, but he wanted to, to get into this. You know, he had the funds to, the income to uh, spare for their, their mortgage and, and take on the rehab with uh, a partner. So uh, some of the main lessons that I learned in this deal were uh, that not every deal is a deal, but uh, you know, with some creativity and passion and uh, you know, working with your network, that you can still maybe possibly close a low margin deal. Um, the power of leverage is a big one for me. Um, it was kind of an eye opener. Um, also, this kind of strategy is uh, not the best uh, for anybody who's going to buy and hold. Um, this might be a good idea for somebody that can uh, do high volume flips quickly, um, just because those profit numbers are so uh, so low. So that's about all I got. Anybody got any questions? Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Boom. Pocket that. You know what I liked about that when I saw that is just the creativity of that. Um, I mean, man, the market. Just if you go back two years ago, everything was normal. You know, you go on the the websites and how you had to buy 70% minus, um, you know, your rehab, and that's your max offer. Well, that worked two years ago, but in the last two years as the market's exploded, those formulas go out the window. If you're going to a house trying to buy at 70% of A or B minus rehab, chances are you're not going to get um, a lot of action on that house. So, you know, we've had to get um, creative with how we're offering. You know, we have to know what our buyers want. Um, and I found that now that things are slowing down, and I can't tell if it's slowing down because there are market trends, um, interest rates going up, etc., or if it's because of the seasons, and we'll find out in another month or two. But we're getting more creative as well with, with our deal, so I really liked that. So, all right, one of the things that we do to help you encourage uh, to bring guests is we do a drawing for some free stuff. Um, tonight we have couple of books. Um, we have the book that we ordered last month for Airbnb that did not arrive in on time. And we have a book on self-directed IRAs. And then we have a book that Attorney Peterson, who's in Munster, he just wrote this book um, on Indiana eviction law. Mm. It's a very um, informative read. It's not the most exciting read, but there's a ton of information in here. And if you have rentals, this is a book I would encourage you to get and read. Um, so we had three tickets, uh, two from the same person and um, another person. So um, every month we're giving away free stuff. Could be a Home Depot gift cards, could be restaurant gift cards, could be a book that kind of is applicable to our topic. 
So, Robert, you get the first choice. The one on eviction law, self-directed IRAs, and Airbnb. All right. Which one, Alan, do you want? Hold on, Robert. There you go. So to qualify for that, um, you have to have come before, and then just bring a guest. And when you come and you sign in, um, let Christy know that you brought a guest. You'll get a raffle ticket, and um, you can win some cool stuff. All right. So Nathan, if you want to come up, look how easy that was. I'm getting really good at this technology thing. Um, Nathan came all the way from Texas to join us today, so I really appreciate that. Um, Nathan's with Quest IRA, and he'll talk a lot about his company and what they do. Um, I've been using Quest for my IRA for three years. Um, I'm probably a little bit biased, but I find them to be one of the best IRA companies to work with. Um, mainly their communication is awesome. I've sent stuff into the office, needed some clarification on stuff, great communication, got it done, and the deal got funded fast like that. I've sold wholesale properties to people using other companies. It's not always as easy. Um, so that's that's one to bring him up. Um, IRAs are awesome. He's going to talk about them. Um, kind of a side story here. I was a biology major in college, and now I flip houses. Um, so they're definitely related. But I always was into money and numbers, so I took an economy class. And one of the projects we had to do was, you know, they were like, think outside the box, come up with an idea that you think would better America or whatever. And I can remember going back to high school where my dad was always complaining about his 401k and how the mutual funds in it weren't really doing well. And I don't remember where, but I read, a, I read about a country that allowed people to do their own investing with their retirement. I'm like, why can't we do that here? Why can't I take my retirement money that's coming out of my check and actually be able to direct it? So I did this report, and the professor was like, wow, that's really cool. And, I'm, you know, and then like three years ago, I learned about self-directed IRAs, and it was like, boom, that's exactly what I was talking about. Obviously, those things didn't start three years ago. They've been around for a long time, but nobody knows about them. And they're powerful and tons of tax advantages, and Nathan's going to walk us through all that fun stuff. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Hey, how's, the, how's everyone doing? Good. My name's Nathan. I'm with you down a little? Whatever works. I'm kind of a loud guy anyway. <laughs> I don't know if we can move it down a little bit. Hey, so I'm the CEO of a company that does self-directed IRAs. And a lot of people go, well, well, you know, how much does that really have to do with what I'm doing as a real estate investor? Like, what is it you can do for you? I don't, either I don't have that much in IRAs, or I, you know, you drained out my IRAs to already buy real estate or do something like that. Man, I got to tell you, I think that it is probably one of the most important things for you to understand as a real estate investor is understand retirement accounts and how they work because it's an understanding of money. And you need to understand money if you want to buy real estate. You know why? This stuff costs a lot of money. You guys figured that out? It isn't about the ability to buy the house. We can all figure out houses we want to buy or real estate we want to buy. It's all about how do I pay for it? Am I wrong? Whether you're a realtor or whether you're uh, a real estate investor or anything else, it's about the money. It is always about the money. And you better understand money. And the problem with it is most of us don't. All right? But most of America's wealth is held through their retirement accounts. And so if we can understand how to tap into that, that is the secret of private money will solve your problem. And especially here in this area. Banks don't like little loans. Anyone ever notice that? They don't like little loans. Private lenders love them. They work well. And, and I know because one of my private borrowers, I do a lot of private lending, is in this room. And that was one of the reasons why I came here. And he's produced returns for me for many, many years. Am I wrong, Tom? So uh, we've been doing it. 
Uh, just like him, we got a disclaimer and a tax legal investor. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. All right. So, what is a self directed IRA? Do any of you guys know? How many of you know who Quest is? Few of you? How many of you know about self directed IRAs? Most of you, some of you. All right. So, what is one? What is that thing? Come on, tell me. Come on, help me. Interaction. We're going to work together here. Huh? Hey, what is it? Guide your own investments, right? Use your own retirement dollars to guide you. He's correct. But what is different about a IRA with equity trust or some trust or quest IRA versus one with Edward Jones or you control it? Okay, go ahead. You're a lot closer. You can invest in non-traditional assets. And I think you're hitting on it. It's important to understand the term <laughs> self-direction is actually just a marketing term. There's no such thing as a self-directed IRA. An IRA is an IRA is an IRA. An IRA with Charles Schwab is, is the exact same thing as an IRA with Quest. But if you are at Charles Schwab and you walked up and said, hey, Chucky, man, I want to take my old 401k out and I'm buy that rental property next door, what do you think? What do you think Chucky's going to say? Oh, man, you can't do that. And why not? And there's a reason, OK? Uh, and I'm not really picking on Charles Schwab or any other uh, a person, as you see when I get done with this slide, is we hold private assets, they hold publicly traded assets. They're licensed securities persons, they have a license to sell you investments, and those investments are publicly traded. Does that make sense? We don't. That's not what we do. That's why we can hold private assets, right? Uh, so if you bring your bucket of money, from their own 401k to Charles Schwab and set it down and say, here you go, Chucky. He goes, why, thank you. Here's a nice selection of investments you can choose from. I've got some stocks and some bonds and some mutual funds and some CDs. And you get to pick, and he gets a commission when you pick those. Again, I'm not picking on them. I'm just trying to describe what he does. When you bring your bucket of money to a company like Quest, we go, well, wow, thank you. A nice Texas accent. Quest. Right? <laughs> well, thank you. Let us know what you need. In other words, we don't tell you what to invest in. We're strictly prohibited. We must maintain ourselves as a neutral party, and you decide. So the takeaway I want you to understand from this slide is most clients are using self-directed IRAs correctly, have an account at both places, one at Charles Schwab and one at Quest. Right? What does Charles Schwab do? They hold your normal investment, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. What does Quest hold? We hold your private investment, your weird stuff, find that real property, do it alone, do an option, do it a joint venture, all the things that we learn and love to study about here can all be done through our self-directed IRS. And if you're doing it right, you move the money back and forth and don't leave a large amount of cash to sit with your self-directed Does that make sense? And, and it's important to understand because part of what I'm trying to teach you is not how to take your retirement money and use it to go buy real estate, but to do what? Do what Tom's doing. He uses other people's money to go buy real estate, right? And then makes us a partner. And if you're going to do that, you need to understand, hey, man, you don't have to take all your retirement and move it over to us. I need, what was that last deal that you needed? I don't know, $56,000 when you're done or whatever. You know, that's what you move over. And when you're done, you move it back. Does that make sense? Uh, so that's a big mistake a lot of people make when they're dealing with self-directed IRAs, they say, hey, do you want to invest with me? And they go, yeah, and then the people get nervous because they think that they have to move all their money over. No, you just move over exactly what you need to do that deal. When you're done with it, move it back over to Chucky and get look for the next one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that the thing? All right, so why would you want one? Why do you want one of these lines? You know, there's different reasons. Uh, diversification, anyone ever heard that? You should diversify your portfolio. I hear that a lot, but a lot of the times the people that are saying that are trying to talk us into diversifying across publicly traded assets, and we're missing one of the largest segments of our economy, which is real estate. I honestly feel that everybody should have part of their retirement or wealth building strategy in real estate. That being said, do you think that everybody should be a property manager? No, I can tell you that's not true. There's some people that really suck at that. I know, I'm one of them. 
Don't laugh, Tom. All right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you should see me trying to collect like grit. Thanks, Dr. Rand. A little bit late. Oh, my goodness, your cat was sick this week. <laughs> You laugh, I'm that bad. I really am, right? I have gotta have professionals in there between me and you. You know, like I just do. You know, but there's other people that are really good at it. My mom, I, I was talking to Tom, my mom's great at it. You know, like she, she not only gets her rent check, they bring her a piece of pie with the rent check. You know what I mean? Like, like she's a phenomenal property manager. And you know my mom, Tom, you know, like she really is. But I honestly don't believe that part of it. I don't diversify at all. I'd say 79% of what I invest is in the same thing, which is notes secured by real estate. Why? Because I understand it. I know it. It does well. And I think if you know, if you invest in the things you know and understand, that's what you should stick with. There are people that are bad at investing in stocks. I mean, you really might say bad, I mean, good. You know what I mean? They're like, they're tough at it. But those are actually pretty few and far between. Most of us are just throwing a big blanket over it and see what happens. And when it's bad, we throw up the drawer. We'll look at it next year. You know, so tax savings. I think tax savings is got to be one of the most important things that you do if you're trying to develop wealth. Why are you here? I mean, there's TV on. There's other stuff going on in this. Why are you here? You're wasting your time. You're wasting some of your energy to be here. If you don't take some of that time to understand wealth and building wealth, um, and learning the tax strategies of it, you're going to miss out on a big portion of what takes place. And unfortunately, it's not the cool part of real estate investing. It's kind of the boring part. It really is. But I think it's fine. But like I said, the last part of it is I think that investing in what you know best. Anybody here have a 401k? <coughs> not with me. What's investing in? Like? Oh, yeah. What is it? Pick on you. Sometimes conservatives fund. Um, you know who companies that the funds own? You do not. Anyone else want to try? I ask this question all over the country. And always funny. I tend to get answers a little different from men. For women, I tend to get what I call really quick. I call it the penguin. They're like, I don't know. <laughs> men get these answers like, well, it's invested in my large caps. Kind of peel the onion a little bit more when it's going you know, like, What does that mean? You know, the cap's a little larger. I mean, honestly, most of us are investing in things that we don't know or understand. And there's a problem with that. That also leads to us investing with the things that are not aligned with our political, right, or our ethical interest. Whenever I'm just investing in an index fund, I guarantee you I'm going to invest in some companies that I don't believe in politically. Which is one of the things that led me to become the CEO of Quest IRA. I peeled open my 401k one day and found out I was investing in bid and construction just after 9-11. That pissed me off. I went off to look on other things. I think a lot of people do that. Now I do something different. I do I I've tried a lot of things, I tried my own property. Now now I now I loan money to real estate investors. Anyone want to borrow some? Anyone? I I already loaned to you, man. That's not fair. <laughs> Right? Who wants to borrow some money? Honestly. Okay, here you go. I'm going to run over here. I'm going to give you my bucket of money. What are you going to do with it? Buy a multifamily. You're going to buy a multifamily. Is it going to be a pretty multifamily? Probably not. Probably not. It's going to be a pretty ugly, right? <laughs> it's going to be that one with the grass growing up and the gutters falling off and someone going, tiss, tiss, tiss. Someone just do something like that. Is that the one you're going to buy? Yep. And then after you buy it, what are you going to do with it? Make it pretty? Yep. Or in Texas, we call it fix er up. Er, the Texas word. <laughs> fix er up, right? And you might need some of my money to fix it up. Now, who are you planning on hiring to fix it up? Bid line construction at the top of your list? He's number three. Number three? <laughs> or are you going to hire local workers, local contractors, buy local woods, create a in, a income and industry for in the place where you live, work, and play, right? Now, I don't really have to give you my bucket of money, do I? Can I close at a title company? Can I ensure that there's insurance on the property and mortgagees clause to cover me as a mortgager on the title policy? And how much interest can you pay me? I'll give you 10%. 10%? Okay. 
just right off the bat, I think I can work it for a little more. What do you guys think? I got 10% pretty quick. <laughs> right? Now think about it. Think about what most Americans are doing out there for just a minute. They're putting their, their, their hard-earned, the hardest earned money they have, the money that is either going tax-free or tax-deferred, they're putting it out there, nameless, faceless companies that may not be aligned with their ethical or their political intentions, right? And they're hoping to possibly get somewhere around the range that she talked about, but they're exposing themselves to great risk. Do we all agree with that? Whereas what's a better choice for most Americans? I don't even know her name. But I know that I can get a loan secured by real estate that I can drive by, see, touch, and feel. I know that I can get above average interest rate. I know that I would be making a socially sound investment because I'm not investing in nameless, faceless companies. I'm investing in my own community. And I can see the people that I create jobs for and work for. So what's a better investment for most people in America? An index fund? Or that young lady back there with the dark hair? Do you get where I'm coming from? And you guys are wondering where it is you're going to get the money to buy all the houses you want. All the money is out there you ever needed. You just need to learn how to tap into it. And there is a secret. There is a secret in how to do it. So if a self-directed IRA isn't a type of IRA, what types of IRAs can be self-directed? There's all different types. We have seven accounts we self-directed at Quest. A lot of them fall right in here, what we call the personal account area, either traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs. I don't know of a wealth-building person, real estate or outside, inside of the United States, that does not talk about the value of a Roth IRA, including me. 90% of the talks that I give include or have a large portion about it about investing in long IRAs. So as real estate investors, what's more important to us, this traditional IRA or the Roth IRA? Roth? Everyone says it, right? Roth, why? It was tax-free. Right, if you've had one for five tax years and you're above the age of 59 and a half, all the gains happen completely tax-free. And so everyone thinks, so if you've got, you got the ability to take a little bit of money and make it worth a whole bunch of money, doesn't it make sense to pay the tax on a little bit of money instead of a whole bunch of money? Right? But everyone's got it wrong. Because the most important account to a real estate investor is the traditional IRA. Can anyone guess why? More money. Someone said it. Ooh. More money. Flip your hand. More money. More money. You've got to fish where the fish is. Most people's wealth are in traditional IRAs because they came from a 401k, 403b, thrift savings plan, 457 plan. In other words, they went to work, both beat a day, found out they can get some free money at work. How do they get the free money? They make a contribution, their employer matches it, their employer gets a tax deduction, they get a tax deduction, they end up with a big old bucket of money after a period of time. Is the bucket really as big as everyone thinks it is? What's wrong with that bucket of money? You never pay tax on it, right? Every time you go to take some out to spend for yourself, you got Uncle Sam there going like, what's in your bucket, man? Can I have some? <laughs> right? We never pay tax on it. So I love to talk about doing Roth conversions. That's where we take that traditional IRA and we pour it into the Roth IRA. And anybody can do that at any age, at any income level now, at any time, with zero penalties, you can take your taxable bucket and turn it into a tax-free bucket. Pretty cool. What's the problem? What did I miss? What did I miss, Alan? Oh, as soon as I knew that, it adds to my modified adjusted growth income. In the year I do, I have to pay tax on it. If you think about the average American reaching retirement age that faces that decision, what would happen if they did that? If you're 55, 50, 59 years old, you're probably still working. But if I did a Roth conversion, what would happen? I'd add money to my modified adjusted uh, you know, converted two or $300,000. I'd add it to my modified adjusted growth income and shoot my income way up. I'd have to pay a big old tax bill, right? And then what happens? I've reduced the amount of money I have to invest. And once you're that age, do you want to be safe with your retirement money or you want to gamble it? 
be safe? Under traditional type of investing, how much being safe pay you? Huh? You get 8% at your bank? Like, like, I mean, where do you get 8% that's secure without being in real estate, honestly? Can't get it through a bond bond or a CD or a money market or any of that. Am I wrong? I mean, if I can, I missed it somewhere, right? It takes something else in. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get a very low return. And because of the adult loss of principal, how long would it take me to make up that huge tax hit? Years. Most of the calculations you look at 20 or 30 years. So most financial planners will look at them and go, absolutely, do not do a Roth conversion. And for most Americans, that is very good advice. But guess what, guys? We're not most Americans. We're real estate professionals. And, uh, <laughs> I'm being silly, but it is a little bit different for us. Okay? Let me give you a little example. Let's move our timeline to January. And as a real estate investor, if I converted enough money to do a buy and flip, how much would that take? 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars here? Someone help me, I'm not familiar. 70 grand. 70 grand. Let's say 100, just, just for, for, for I added that to my modified adjusted growth income, I'm already making a lot of money. So, so I'm gonna have to pay 37% tax. When would I pay that tax? Remember I said January is when I did the deal. Huh? Not that year. The following year, April the following year. Okay, it doesn't affect your quarterly payments because it's a, 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 a conversion, so we can pay it April the following year. Flippers in the room, you buy a house and fix her up in 16 months. And so, huh? You bet? Can you do it twice? Can, can you make 20, 30, 40%? You see what I'm, you see what I'm getting at? I could do a conversion and actually pay the taxes with the investment that is done prior to the taxes even being due. And then how long would it grow tax-free after that? Not forever. It's until one or two events. With a Roth IRA, you never have to take it out because there's no what we call required minimum distributions. But one or two things. You take it out and buy something cool, right? Okay, that's okay to do because that's why we're getting wealthy. If we take the money out, buy something, a beach house or something, that, that, that's what stuff, that, that makes sense, right? And when I die, and when I die though, it becomes something very magical. It becomes what's called a beneficial Roth IRA. A beneficial Roth IRA grows just like a Roth IRA, completely tax-free. But the owner of that has been received to, they can remove money tax-free and penalty-free at any age and any time. I've got some young people in this room, right? How old are you, young lady? Don't tell me. But how would you like to have an account with a couple hundred thousand dollars in it that you can buy houses, fix them up, and then take the profit off the table and put it in your pocket tax-free and penalty-free? Would you use that? It's a powerful, powerful account. The most powerful type of account. What's the problem with the account? Someone's got to die for you to get one. you got to, you got to pay attention to that, right? Uh, so, man, thing. But, but anyway, so that's why Roth IRAs, and I talk a lot about them, but it's also important to understand that 86% of all the investments we see at Quest come from traditional IRAs. Most of the time when you're borrowing someone's money, or you're using someone else's money, they're not going to kin up to the idea of doing this Roth conversion and paying all this taxes now. Does that make sense? And you may confuse them about talking about Roth IRAs too much. So you might mention it, hey, if you do a Roth conversion, you might give them some information, but, but that's more for you as the real estate investor as you use other people's money, you know, understand that you may be getting that either tax deferred or something else. You think that's a good point, Tom? I mean, you know what I mean? You do things, you do it a long time. There's other types of accounts that we uh, SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, and I wish I had time to talk about covered else and health savings accounts. Most people have never ever thought of using their health savings account to buy a house, right? Completely tax free. You ever thought about doing such a thing like that? It's an amazing account. It's one of the people get mixed up with something called a flexible spending account where you get to the end of the year, you have to use it. No, health savings account, you get to save the benefit for years and years and years ahead. And you can pick up receipts from years past. So even if you have a little bit of money in your account right now, you can do a real estate uh, uh, deals into that, make it grow, and pick up receipts from 
10 years past. It's going to be one of the most powerful concepts I know in real estate investing is using health savings account to add to your real estate portfolio. I've got a class about that. Just HSA, the guy class about doing Roth conversions. I don't want to spend too much time talking about those, but those are important ideas and I just want to take a minute to plant some seeds because I've got some information that, that you might look into at the back of the room. All right. All of those accounts can be self-directed individually or combined. Those accounts are what we call disqualified to each other. In other words, they can't buy, sell, trade, and extend services. And I was talking to our host, and he's like, man, I got some money in a Roth IRA, and it, but it's not enough to buy a house. I don't know what to do with it. And we're like, you can partner with yourself. Right? You can take your Roth IRA money and own it 20% of your Roth IRA, 80% owned by you. As long as that's expenses that happen, 20% occur to the Roth IRA, 80% occur to you, and as profit comes back in, 20% to the IRA, 80% to you. You can't do what we call disproportionate distribution. But disqualified persons can partner together. And this is such an important thing to understand when we're starting to use other people's retirement money. When you talk to somebody at, uh, about the use of their money, you're you're going to find out something. Most households have little buckets of money everywhere, right? You got that little old 401k, you found out one year you got a SEP IRA to reduce your taxes. Someone told you to get a Roth IRA, you did get a covered LP, you thought you were going to be able to pay for kids' college, even though it doesn't look like you're going that way now. You know, whatever. Uh, uh, you, whatever it is. Your wife's had this, and you've got all these little accounts, you can actually partner all of those together to create one loan. Or do you think you guys are going to have a good understanding after I speak up here for 45 minutes about how to do all of this? Probably not. Do you have to? It's just like, do you have to be a, know how to do plumbing? Or do you have to know how to be an attorney? Or do you have to know how to do, know everything about insurance to buy insurance? No. All you have to know is someone like Katie in the back of the room playing with her hair. Right? You have to know an IRA specialist and have one in your pocket that you can pick up the phone and call questions to, ask questions at any that time you want. Like I said, there are restrictions on these types of accounts. And when you do a restriction, it's pretty horrific. If you do a restriction, it can entirely blow up the IRA and has some of the highest fine areas and IRS codes. I know a person who wants to receive a one point 162% penalty from a transaction he did in his IRA. The transaction was $100,000. That sounds pretty painful, doesn't it? Until you realize it's not the $100,000 transaction that he does that gets the penalty. It was his entire retirement account, which was $1.2 million or a $2 million penalty on a $100,000 transaction. Now do I ask your attention? We don't want to do these. They're really, really bad. But here's good news. It's really easy to avoid them if you pay attention to the next five minutes of speech. All right? The biggest thing that we have a problem in prohibited transactions are disqualified people. The people who can't do business with the IRA. We must identify them. If we can get a hold of who can't do business with the IRA, and what, when I say business, what I mean is they can't buy, sell, trade, or extend services or receive a benefit directly or indirectly. Who do you think are disqualified persons to the IRA? Huh? Miners? No. No, miners are just fine, actually. It's actually you. You are disqualified to your own IRA. You know what? See, let me explain to you. When it's in an IRA, it's not really your money. It's money that's held in trust. It's held in trust for you for a specific purpose. I'm using the term IRA, IRA, HSA, 401k, all the same thing. In other words, that money has been set there with a specific um, need. In this case, if I'm talking about retirement accounts, it's for your retirement. I'll say it's your health care. It's a specific need. It gets a special tax privilege because of that need. Does that make sense? And so if it's your retirement money, you can't use it to benefit yourself. Now, your benefit is in the future when you take that out. Does that make sense? So you, you can direct your IRA to buy a house, but you could live in it. That would be a benefit. It has to be a rental property. And where do you think all the income from the rental comes from goes? Right back to the IRA. 
you must separate your money from your IRA's money. Your IRA is investing for your future. How do you cover your food now? How do you eat now? You use other people's IRAs. You see how that works? But, uh, so we take our knowledge and we try to grow some of our knowledge for the future using our IRAs, but we use other people's IRAs to create income for now. So you are a disqualified person to your IRA. You can't buy, sell, trade, or extend services. Did I say you can't partner? No, you can partner disqualified people. You just can't buy, sell, or trade. There are other people who are equally disqualified to the IRA other than yourself. And I made this little simple chart. <laughs> okay, forget the chart. Don't even look at it. I'm going to give you disqualified people, what I call it stewardess stop. You, you ever get on an airplane and show you how to button your seatbelt and get to the exits, right? Well, this is disqualified people this way. Disqualified people to your IRA do include yourself as well as your spouse. And your lineal ascendants and descendants. What am I talking about? Parents and children. And their spouses. <laughs> and don't forget, companies those people own, control, manage, or highly compensated employees thereof. There's your disqualified people without the chart. Is that easier? Yes. <laughs> Guys, I'm trying to be a little bit silly to try to get you to understand something or remember something that's really important. Did I say brother? Did I say sister? Did I say stepchildren? No. We have to know as what I like to call, you know, once you become a good real estate investor, you're really an architect. You understand that. You're, you're, art, you're, you're creating deals or, or building deals. In order to build deals, you need to understand how they work, right? And so we must understand what we can't do. We can't take our IRA and put it into this deal. We can't buy, sell, trade, or extend services to and from. We use other people's IRA, right? So when we're building deals, we have to understand who we can do business with and who we can't. With our family, well, what do we do? We group them together like we do with my family. My family, my mom and my brother and our 401k, and then we go out and look for investors and we loan money to investors and get above average interest rates secured by real estate. That's how I bet Tom. How many years ago? How many years has it been? Five? Has it been good for you? Is it the easiest money you get? Honestly, yeah. it's pretty easy. Oh God, hey, I got another one, right? Send, <laughs> send a wire. Okay? Once you get established a relationship with someone, it becomes pretty easy. All right? So then we're going to talk about, um, and we kind of already did, prohibited transactions. It's just the things that the people can't do. We already talked about that. Buy, sell, trade, or extend services. Boom, done with that one. Then we're going to talk about there are specific investments that can't be done in IRA. One is collectibles. Collectibles are specifically mentioned as works of arts, gems, or metals or alcoholic beverage collections. <laughs> if you're buying booze in your IRA, you've got a bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And then it's not just. And the other one is uh, 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 collect life insurance policies and collectibles. Sorry, I had that backwards. It doesn't affect us. The only thing that we really need to understand about prohibited transactions is disqualified people. So if you can remember my little dance up here, you've got it down. Fair enough. There are more complexities, but that's when you pull Katie out of your pocket and say, hey, Katie, I met you up in Indiana. What's happening here? All right? All right. And I, I have over 15 IRAs. That shows all that. What can you buy inside a self-directed IRA? Anything you can take title to. Most people think Quest is a real estate IRA company because Dan Quincy has spent a lot of time talking about it. So you see a lot of commercial properties, foreclosures, apartments, condos, options, unapproved land, tax liens. They want like tax liens in this state. Woohoo! Super popular, right? But, uh, but the truth is, is that's only represents about 19% of the holdings at Quest. Our largest holding asset is notes. Most of them are secured by real estate. And then we have a lot of private entities like limited liabilities, limited partnerships, joint ventures. We have a lot of trust at Quest because we like trust. Uh, a lot of, some of the self-directed companies don't. So we, we do a lot of those. But notes, secured notes, unsecured notes, mortgages, verbal notes. Is this a mortgage state or a deed of trust state? Mortgage. Mortgage state. So. Anything that you can take title to, you can actually hold to a self-directed IRA. There's very few exceptions. And we do have some weird stuff like soy sauce companies <laughs> and you know rocket ships that you know they got people and things in and horse sperm, you know, like horse sperm and weird stuff. 
talk, but it doesn't really matter. Don't look at me that way. It's like, you know, you take a little horse thing and you put them together to make a big horse. You sell a big horse for lots of money. Okay, nothing. All right. So how do you do it? You open an account, hopefully with Quest or any other self-directed IRA. Right? You fund the account. How do most people fund an IRA? They transfer in it from an existing uh, custodian or something. I have a belief that everybody should have a Roth IRA with Quest if you're in this room. Do you think that's prejudice? Just a little bit, Alan? Just a little bit? Yeah, of course it is. All right? But honestly, I mean, how much does it take to have a Roth IRA? Do you guys do wholesale and options like you do in Houston? Anyone does? We were seeing the wholesaling example up here earlier. How much did you put down on that for the earnest money? Like, you write a $10 earnest money check? 100 bucks. Hello. And we do it all the time. 100 bucks. And in Texas, they do 10 all the time. I actually like a reason to do 100 bucks. There, there's some legal reasons to use 100. You can make a contribution for $10, and now you have a Roth IRA. And it, it started this five year clock. You can hold it for $10, and then when one of those options come along, do an option in your Roth IRA. 10 bucks. 10 bucks can get it started. You know, or 100 bucks. Like, do, you, do you always use 100 or? Whatever. Because that tip doesn't really matter, but you have to do start with it. Anyway, so you don't have to actually have it, an existing account or anything else. Locate the investment. If you called Katie up and said, hey, Katie, what should I invest in? Or Nathan? She go, I don't know. She gave you the thing. You find out what you invest in here at the real estate clubs. That's why they're important. That's not what we do. You've got to use the right tool, right? If you said, hey, Nathan, this is what I want to invest in. How do I do it with my IRA? Ah, we can talk about that. Hey, this one I'm invested, is that prohibited or not prohibited? Ah, we can talk about that. Hey, this one's invested, do you think this is going to create unrelated business income tax? Ah, I can talk about that. You see what I'm saying? We can talk about education, but we can't give you specifically what to invest in and not to. But we always have to have this. Here's some case studies. This is Robert and his wife, right? Uh, uh, and, and they also have a nine-year-old son, okay? They're new real estate investors. They had never done a, a real estate deal before. They went to a club. They didn't get a little coaching from the person. They wanted to do their first real estate deal, right? So they looked around and they decided that this was the house they were buying. It was a home that was in the neighborhood they were living in, okay? Uh, 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 and they thought it would be good for a purchase and a flip or even a purchase and a rental. They were hoping to do a purchase and a flip on the particular property. They looked at going to a hard money lender and buying it, put money down. But they were both working hard. They didn't have that much ready cash available to them. Does that make sense? So they decided to use their IRA. This is how it worked. Their purchase price was just about $100,000. It was about $30,000 in repairs for about a total of one thirty. Okay. The husband's IRA put in 60% or $78,000. The wife's IRA put in 35%. And here's the, the, the important part of the story I want to talk about. There was a small amount in the child's covered up education account, health savings account. You fill in anything else to your own little Roth IRA that you just put a little bit of money into. It had a small amount of money into it. All right? Uh, they made an offer to purchase the Roth IRA. This whole thing ended up on the title, including as to an undivided interest. You know, we broke down the different interests on, on there. They bought the house, they fixed the house. One month later, they sold it for 189 or, or netted about 180 is what, what they ended up. I run the numbers, but this is a true story. They had a tax gain of $50,000. Uh, $50, well, what happened is the husband's IRA got his money back plus $30,000. The wife got her money back plus $17,000. The covered up got his money back plus $2,500. Is there any way in heck that that $6,000 account could have made $2,000 in, in four months? without partnering with the larger amounts of money. Can you see that? This is one way that we can take larger, larger amounts of money, partner them with small amounts of money to increase the amount of growth. Do you have a question or just stretch? Stretch. Okay, good. Get one answered anyway. <laughs> so, one of the amazing things is about this story is a, is a method that I use with my own children. As, have you ever talked to your children about investing? I got boys. You ever try that? It's like you're talking peanuts. Mama, 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 mama. They don't hear you. So I went to my son. I said, hey, son, man, good news. I'm going to give you $5,000. He's 17 years old. <gasps> really? Cool. But I'm going to put it in a Roth IRA. You won't get it for like a month. Oh, man. 
started coming to the real estate thing, we just wanted something more. It wasn't really a money thing that was driving him. It was that he, the job itself was not what he wanted to do. Does that make sense? And so, so he would, every night, he'd go to bed, he'd write these little letters, handwrite letters, and he'd make himself handwrite 10 letters to ask people if he could want to buy a house. And he came across this property. The house was worth $85,000 after repairs, okay? The outstanding loan balance was 82, okay? There was $3,000 in back payments and $4,500 to close and repair the property, right? PITI payments were $865, principal, and rent in the areas ran between $1,000 to $1,100. Who wants that deal? Let's look at it. We got negative equity, right? And after figuring a, a, a vacancy rate, right, there's a... Uh, Really, no cash flow. Everyone agrees with that? Why would you ever want to do that deal? But let's stop and think about it. Take young Katie. Katie's worked for me for four or five years. She's uh, less than 30. She makes good money at Quest IRA. We have a good 401k. That young lady works hard all of her life, and she maxes out her 401k payments and puts, you know, five to seven to ten thousand dollars a year away into 401k. How much is she going to have when she's 60, 65? A million dollars? Maybe, you know, something like that. You know, who knows? But she'll have a decent amount. Here's the trick to doing the same amount of money in her retirement as she would have on one year's worth of gain. What is it? Buying a property subject to that existing finance. Right. An IRA can own a property with a loan on it, but the loan has to be non recourse. In other words, you can't guarantee that loan. But if I buy a property subject to, is that loan recourse? It is, but not to the IRA. It's recourse to the original owner. Why would this owner ever give up this property if, if they had to keep on the loan? Well, they're going to lose the property. They're going to have a foreclosure and some things. And they've already gone to a rent realtor. The realtor told them they can't sell it because they're upside down, basically, by the time they catch up on the roof. Anybody think they can find this property? You can find it all day long. Ask any realtor that you're out there. But if you take a look at it from that point of view, putting $8,500 down and sitting and holding, just waiting, what happens over Katie's lifetime? Is that house always going to have a monthly payment on it? This particular deal that Bob bought was 19 years or 11 years that are already paid off. So he's got 19 years to go before the property's paid off. Are the rents going to stay the same? No. Is the property value going to change? Of course it is. How much is it going to go up? At least national average doubles about every 11 years, right? Depends on where it is. Bob was really lucky. He bought this in a nice area. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, this particular house is worth about four hundred. $20,000 right now. Most likely, most of us aren't going to get that lucky, but he did in this particular property because why? Well, it was a small house, inner city, in that particular area kind of blew up. He got kind of lucky, you know, uh, kind of thing. But my point being is even if it's just normal gains, someone like Katie, she's got enough time to make this investment work, right? In 10 years, is that property going to be worth the same? No, it's going to double. In 10 more years, is it going to double? A double again. Now we're at 400, and it doubles again. With rents and everything else, she'll have over a million dollars based off of one year's contribution versus putting money in for her entire life. And what happens if you did one of those deals every year? Who's old in this room? Who's got some gray hair? Does that work as well for you, young man? Come on, you've got 40. 40 years like Katie, does that work? How old are you? So you're 64. Why would he want to do that? <coughs> does that make any sense for him? Are you going to die at 74? 84? 94? We don't know. You might die at 65. It doesn't matter. But that's not when your account dies. Remember, you get to pass this on to your children and it becomes a beneficial IRA. <coughs> So when we're talking about doing these types of deals, we're not talking about just building wealth for ourselves, but building wealth for ourselves and future generations. And when we start to think about this, this is when we start to really build wealth, is when we're able to think about time and other things into the factor. I think time is the most important 
factor in real estate investing. Whether it's the amount of time you have to do in it, or the other factor that a lot of people miss is the amount of time you put into a deal. I'm an experienced real estate investor. I know a lot. I know a lot about construction. I know a lot about running a business. I'm not bragging. I've, I've got a long list of things. There's people in this room that can verify all of this. I know a lot about finances, right? Why don't I go out and buy houses and fix them up myself? Time. It costs me a lot of time. My time is very valuable. Running press takes a long time. I'm much better suited to give it to one of you guys and then we can split her up somehow. Split up the profits at the end, get the, most of the time I just get an above average interest rate, you guys keep the lion's share, whatever. That makes the sense. So I always say factor time into it. This guy's time is different than that guy's time just simply because they're different age, right? He's got more time you can put on his investment, he's got less time, because you're gonna die. <laughs> You get my idea, past more than 20 years retirement stuff, right? But I mean, seriously, that's something that you've got to think about is that time factor in investing, okay? How do you profit now, guys? It's easy. Every gathering you go to, there are millions of dollars available for investment, including right here in this room with other that don't even aware of. But it's a little bit different. Anyone here use private money? Anyone? Right? What's the difference between finding private money and finding a deal? If you're a real estate investor, you should always be looking for two things. Money and deals. What comes first? Oh, you got the answer right. It don't matter. I'm looking for both all the time. Doesn't matter. You, you, you got a deal, you got money, money, a deal. But here's the difference. When you find a deal on a real estate deal, you better turn around and go find another one. Do you know why? Because as soon as you're done with that deal, you're unemployed. Your next deal is always more important than the deal you have in your pocket. I know it sounds weird, but marketing, as a, uh, as a real estate investor, you've got to get used to not getting so involved with your deal that you're on that you forget about the marketing. Am I wrong with any experienced real estate investors? Is that true? But when you find an investor, a private money investor, you found one. You found one. Because what happens at the end of your deal? You, you've done, have you done a couple of them now? Just no, you don't know, right? And, and at the end of your first deal with a private money investor, what did he tell you? Like, see you think, oh, Mike, can you do it again? And usually it's something like this. Wow, you know, you pay back the interest and the money, and you go, wow, that was pretty cool. Could you do it again? Try to please. And by the way, I got a little bit more money I didn't tell you about the first time. And my brother's got some money, and my mom's got some money. People get excited about it. It's actually a dangerous time in a real estate investor because your, your investors can start to push you to do deals and you start to do deals that are a little dumber than you should have done in the first place. So learning to have private money in your pocket is so important. Being able to walk up to any house and go, I know I can buy that because somebody will find it. One of my good friends about 10 years ago quit his job, uh, he was a detective, and he was a really good detective. There's no problem being a good detective, he had worse and worse clients. You know what I mean? And it started to with his head, and he bailed on it. Like, this dude was super smart, you know, a success. He said, I'm gonna be a real estate investor, he had no clue. He started coming to classes, and you know, meeting people, and we looked back over it, and he's borrowed private money in the last 11 years, $42 million. And we're not talking about, he's not buying like houses in downtown Chicago. You know what I mean? He's, he, he's buying bread and butter houses, one after another, fixing them up, putting them all the way. Holy, all right. You're, I'm amazed. Uh, also, kind of pissed, pissed me off a little bit because he's also made more money than I had um, <laughs> in these last 11 years. But you know, he's doing pretty good. I'm pretty proud of him. I'm like, how many lenders do you have? I said, you must have hundreds. And I said, how wealthy are they? <coughs> most of them are they're pretty well off, but most of them aren't super wealthy. Most of them are engineers and ex-retired cops that I knew. You know, and what would happen is they'd lend me the money, I'd do a deal, I'd give it back to them, they had a little bit more money to lend, and they became wealthier with me. They're wealthier now because of me and because of what we do. 
your relationships with the private money lender are super important. Do you think it's hard? Hey man, how's it going? What's up man? How you doing? I need about $180,000. Is that conversation hard? I'm telling you it is hard. But there's a way to have it. Right? And, and, and this works. I'll give you a little thing. I have a whole class about how to borrow money or lending classes. But basically, you just run the same thing. Hey, man, what are you doing with your retirement money? Or what are you guys doing with your retirement money? You might ask someone like that. And most of you in your vision think that people are going to tell you, that's none of your business. That's like what you're envisioning did say in your mind. But most people don't say that. They say something like this. Oh, my God. I had a whole bunch in there, and then I lost a bunch, and I haven't looked at it in five years because I threw that thing in the drawer, but I really don't know. They will puke on you. <laughs> Literally puke on you all their, and you go, wow. I mean, like, like they just open right up. Why? Because they're feeling a lot of pain. People are in a lot of uncertainty out there with the marketplace. And, like, and you listen for a minute, and then you say, wow, I know what you're feeling like. I, I felt that way, too. I took my retirement money, and I invested in notes secured by real estate. It's turned out really well for me. I'm a real estate investor, but I can't use my IRA. I can't loan it to myself, so I loan it to some other real estate investment. I get above average return. I get, you know, 8 to 10%. I'm secured by real estate. I know it's a socially conscious investment. I, I could drive by it, see it, touch it, and feel. I know that I'm creating, uh, taking up life in the community where I live, work, and play, and making it a better place. I'm creating jobs and things like that, and, and it works really well. I mean, if you ever want to talk about it or something, I'd have to talk to you about it. I mean, it's been really life-changing to me. Really. And then, when you get the opportunity to talk about it, be very professional about it. You need to, at that point, bring in your professionals. Who are your professionals? First one is, are you guys going to really understand IRAs? It takes me four years. I scour the country for some of the brightest kids in the entire country, and then I get them to my work, and then I take another four years to get all that crap they put in their heads out, okay, to make an IRA specialist. Do you need all that? No. Have a good attorney, a good title company, a good to other people that you say, I use professionals, right? Remember, if you call Katie into the room, she's a complete neutral party. She has no reason to tell anybody to invest or not to invest. And if, they, if you go out and you know you can use your retirement money to do this, give me your money, that sounds one way. But if you say, hey, you can use your retirement money, let me tell, let you talk to some professionals and allow them to get you some information that would be useful for you to make that decision. Isn't that how we make decisions? All right? So every gathering, billions of dollars of that, spread the knowledge and talk to them about how they can improve their lives and improve the lives of the city where we live, work, and play by investing in a retirement company into their own community. So what you need to do is you use other people's IRAs to meet your needs for today. While we use your IRA to grow wealth for the future and use that in other people's fields. Does that make sense? That's still a little helpful. A little bit different. I'm trying to get you to think about some different things because I can't teach it to you all. Guys, we have tons of education and it's free. Am I here in Indiana? No. But good news, we're in the same time zone. What does that mean? You laugh. Dead. I have a big education office in Houston, a big education office in Dallas, and a big education office in Austin. We put 600 different events on a year. 600 of them. I got four different speakers. Most of them are recorded online, and at the end of them, you have networks. And all you have to do is log on online and talk to the moderator and say, I have a deal. I'm looking for a lender. I need $72,000. Go play it right there. And that will not only go out to the people that are live in that classroom, but everybody else across the country. You don't have to like physically show up to actually get get complaint. Plus, you might actually learn something by watching some of these classes for brief part piece. Why do you think we provide so much education? Because that's how we promoted our company. Education, our educated uh, investors are the people that use it. Right. If you'll look, I'll show you my fees in a second, but it's like a few hundred bucks a year an average person pays in Westfield. It's not very much money. How do we make our money? 
We make money from people once they learn how to use it, they buy real estate, they hold real estate in their, the, their accounts year after year after year after year. And we've slowly grown our company uh, uh, to, to great size. I'll never grow past my ability to service you guys, ever. I give you data, I promise. All right, so what can we do for you? We can process investors, investments faster than anybody in, that does our job. There's companies bigger than us, but nobody's faster. And I just, as of yesterday, greatly increased my speed. I'm convinced I can fund a real estate transaction in less than 15 minutes. All right, but funding the same day is no issue at all. Okay, same with pals. Guess what, Tom? Phone app. Your your lenders can pay directly on on, on a phone, and it will split up now to the different accounts. And the ACH time's been decreased from five days down to less than two. So that's when you receive it in your account. Everything's faster. Everything's going to be faster because we, we got to do things, right? We hold networking and opportunities. They call about you after free to attend. You can come, whether you're in the state or not, right? And no self-directed company understands your investments better than us. We grew up from where you guys started. Or real estate investors that started self-directing that ended up actually accidentally stumbled into this and then grew into a big company. But in the end, our heart is real estate investing. We know what you're doing. We know the problems that you have, and we share those with you. Right? And I'll never charge you an extra fee to expedite your deal. I don't care what it happens, but sometimes you've got to get it. It needs to close today. You guys understand what I'm talking about? You can pick up the phone and talk to one of my IRA specialists. IRA specialists have full authority, signature authority. They're all officers of the company. They can go in and they can move your deal to the front of the line, right, and get it funded. And that's something that most people don't have. How much does it cost? It's 100 bucks to open an account, plus you have to make a contribution. But what do you get for 100 bucks? First thing, uh, oh, how do you make a contribution? You can transfer it, roll it over, or make a contribution. You get unlimited accounts for $100. What do I mean by that? I'll never charge you or your family another account opening fee. So if you needed a traditional IRA, plus maybe a Roth IRA, you're thinking about a SEP IRA, but your wife needed a Roth IRA down the road, you have 19 grandkids, and they all need Coverdell education account, plus you have a health savings account. How much would all that cost? 100 bucks. Five years from now, you need another Roth IRA. How much is that? Nothing. You paid your 100 bucks. Fair enough? Okay. Also, if you do a transaction in the first uh, 30, 60 days, 90 days, what is it? 90 days. I'll give you your 100 bucks back. All right? So how much does it really cost to make them? It's super cheap. Okay. I don't know if you can read all of this, but there's different things. You, you have to pay $125 when you buy a house, whenever we close. All right? So that's the purchase asset fee. A lot of people here are using trust where we would buy, the IRA buys the trust, and the trust might buy or sell multiple IRAs from multiple things. Now, do I have to pay $125 every time that I close if I'm buying with the trust? No, I paid $125 once when I bought with that trust, and I never pay it again. The trust or the LLC buys it, and let it go. After that, we do have to pay yearly fee, either a flat fee of $295, this fee, or the stupid fee that almost no one pays, okay? So fee one works like this. It's 295 flat fee. I buy a house, right? I paid 125 when I close plus 295. I'm good for a year. I wait a year, I get another bill for 295. If I'm buying stuff for a half a million dollars, that works really well. You know what I mean? Because I'm paying one thing, 295 a year. What happens if I'm buying lots for 5,000 bucks? Right, 295 for each lot per year. I mean, it's not going to work. You want to follow? I'm saying, so we develop this one, which is what we do is we take the value of your account. We don't care how many assets are in there. You have 20 lots in there, but if they equal $10,000 or less than 10,000 there, then you pay 34.75 a quarter. So you're, you know, you pay 125 when you close, and then you wouldn't pay anything for three months because it's paid quarterly in arrear. You pay 3475. Does that make sense? This is the one that works for most people because most of us are buying property, debt leverage, or having small accounts that we're trying to use our strategies as a real estate investor. Our lenders most of the time are going to be over here. Our, our, everyone follow that? Because they're lending us a hundred thousand dollars. And who typically pays that? 
give you the, the bar. You, you see what I'm saying? You don't charge your lender, you pay your, your IRA fee. Is 295 cheaper than an application for a loan? Mm -hmm. On a hard money loan? You see what I'm getting at? All right, so, and, and where do you pay that money if you're a borrower? How, how do you pay it out? Does that come out of your pocket? No, oh, it comes out of the loan. Hello. I mean, if you're doing it right with private money every time you close, you should be getting a little bit of money at closing. Tom, am I wrong here? You get a little bit when we close, right? Right off the right at the time, and then you get a little bit when you get the rents, and then you get a little bit when you sell. You get paid all along. All right. So for a lot of network, there's this other family. It's called the Gold Family Plan. I mean, it's twenty-four dollars a year, and then I never pay any other fees for you or your family. That doesn't make sense to too many people. You would really have to do a lot of transactions. But I have some people that do them. Here's the deal. I'll give you this last one for free, provided one thing. You move an asset over from an existing custodian. I don't care who it is. Some other custodian. Equity trust. <coughs> I'm sorry, I was mean. You move an asset over from another custodian, I know that it may cost you some money to do that. It might hit you with an account closing fee, or we may have to retitle that asset. See? So even if you like me, you may that might be preventing you from doing that. So what I'll do is I'll give you the gold family plan absolutely free. I won't charge you an account opening fee, just give me that damn account from that way you Alright? And I won't charge you any fees at all for six months. The only thing that's outside of that are like wire fees and, and overnight fees. Fair enough? And then after that, you can switch from any account plan that you want to at any time. I want your business here. All right? Um, guys, also pay attention to what I'm telling you about, I was having this conversation about going to the classes and investing. If you guys are having, how many people are having a hard time finding you money? Just one? Most of you? No. I would think most of you are. Do you know what we have a hard time finding in, in Texas? Deals. California? New York? Where do people want to put their money? Left and right, they're being told we need to put our money here, in these areas, right, in the breadbaskets of America, because that's where the deals are. Uh, all over Houston, you have people coming in and talking about it. You got these note buyers and everything else. And oh man, you don't want to buy notes here. You want to buy notes. Here. Right. I'm telling, I'm telling you that that's where it is. There's plenty of money out there, guys. And hopefully, this opened your eyes to a little bit. Um, that's just how you feel now. I'm not going to do all that. Can you do that? That's my email address. I'm Nathan at Quest IRA. You guys have any questions? Yes, ma'am. How do we compare to equity trust? They're much bigger than this. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, uh, we are faster, we're smaller. So, but the biggest difference, I don't think there's much difference in price. Most self directed custodians, unless you're, you know, worth 50 or $60 for each other. So, what's the biggest difference? When you have a problem, you can pick up the phone and talk. If you open an account back there with Katie, Katie will be here next year. She'll be here five years from now. She'll be here for 10 years. Right? You can pick up the phone and talk to somebody that will help you and they're going to understand. If you say, I'm going to buy something subject to, they're not going to ask you, is that legal? <laughs> right? If you're going to say, I need to get this funded right now, right? They're going to say, hold on, let me get you a call center. We don't have a call center. When you call up the phone request, I guarantee you one thing. You're going to get answered by a phone by somebody who wants to really help you, and they're going to answer this and ask you, how can I make your day? And why? Because they really love their jobs. They love their jobs because people call all the time going, wow, you changed my life. I used to get 1 or 2% interest, now I get 10%. Long to it to that girl with dark hair in the back. Thank you guys for having me. Yes, sir. Let's say I have an account with you guys already. I don't want to open up some covered hell accounts. Free. Let's make sure. Yeah, if you already have an account with us, you want to open some additional one? Free. He's like Oprah tonight. Woo! Look, 
under your seat, there's a car seat! A car for everybody in the audience! No, I'm just joking. Is there a way to buy in your LLC? And here's the problem, and you've got to be careful with it. Remember who the disqualified people are. You, your spouse, your family, your business, and companies those people own, control, manage, and highly compensated by. Never use your existing LLC. Can you have an LLC? Yes. But what's the problem with having an LLC? Who the managing member is. Okay? And there's a lot of people out there that will go, oh, just, just here, give me $10,000, $5,000, $2,000, whatever it is, and I'll set you up with a checkbook control IRA. I'll just make an LLC and you and the managing member, it makes all those things that nerdy people like they can go away. Man, watch that stuff right now. That's super, super dangerous. Don't combine your funds. Don't use your LLC. Call Katie, talk to her about it. Right? It's really simple to isolate yourself. If you have a checkbook control IRA, guys, listen to me. I know it's worked well in the past. It's not going to go into the future. They're lining up and looking for these things, and they're going to start taking them down. In the past, we used to only have to report the value of the account. Now I have to report the value of the account and one or two items more, whether it's got real estate in it and whether it's got a single managing member LLC, which is just what they're looking for. So no, no, no. But could you have an LLC? Yes, just make the money of me. Your friend or someone else, and then that will give you that isolation that you need. You might consider a trust, though, it's cheaper. You don't need asset protection. It's my rate. That's not a whole discussion. Sorry. I'll pontificate forever if you let me. <laughs> Sir? What type of training do I have? Oh, Lord. See Katie in the back of the room. We, we, we have about uh, 80 different classes that we teach. We teach about everything from Lending to problems with buying entities, to unrelated business income tax, um, to really weird subjects. You know, it, it, and if there's something that you want a topic on, we can probably find it or have done it or bring in a specialist from somewhere. All right. One of the big things that we do is we do cruises. My brother does these financial cruises, so we get professionals all over the place. And and I've after 11 years of doing these, I've never been on one. But, but uh, 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 still look at me that way. I, I haven't. Somebody has to run the business one of brothers out there doing that. But I mean, what a great idea. You get, you get professionals come from all over the place. So we, we really, because we've been conservative for a long time and, and grown really slow, we have a really good network of, of uh, professionals that we can dive into and get, get information and provide you whatever type of education that you want. Yes, ma'am? Quincy is my brother. Did, did you like that? Yeah, I'm the better looking one, but he's smarter than I am. I, I'm telling you, it's not embarrassing to say Quincy's smarter than you, because when we were kids, like, he would sit on the porch and read the dictionary. Not like the little one. I'm, I'm talking like, like the Webster one every year. And then at the end of the summer, he would write a little letter to Webster to explain where the mistakes were. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm okay to say that I'm, yeah. Like he's, he's, is he not very brilliant, though? <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Guys, it's been a real pleasure. Oh, sir. You cannot. I mean, like in those case studies, at least for my interpretation, like some of those case studies, they have done to themselves. Not, a, not, a, not all. What they were doing is partnering. They put in a little bit, and they put in a little bit, and they put in a little bit. So let's say you had a house you want to buy and you had half of it in cash in your IRA and half of it in cash just sitting around in your piggy bank. You can buy that half for your IRA and half you. But as expenses occurred, you'd have to pay half with the IRA and half you. And as the money came back in, half you. Think of it like this. Could you own Coca-Cola stock if you had Coca-Cola stock in your 401k? Sure, you could buy Coca-Cola stock, right? Could you buy that stock from yourself and that for no, that would be improper for you to buy it from yourself there. But you can buy more Coca-Cola stock. You see what I'm saying? So the same type of thing. Anyone else? Guys, thank you. I've been wanting to come here for a long time and intend on coming back. Tom, it's great seeing you too. We'll talk some more. I'll be from the off. Uh, I know. That was pretty good. I was impressed. I've actually been to Texas a couple of times to go to their events. Um, they're very well run. Lots of good information down there. 
and um, I like to go in the winter when it's cold up here and warm down there. So um, I've actually met a couple of people down there. We haven't done deals together yet. A lot of it's built on trust and relationship, but you know we email, and it's just a matter of time before I have another lender from down there. Um, real quick, if you have a deal tonight, this would be your opportunity to share it. It can be a wholesale deal. You can be looking for money, have money, um, service. So if you want to talk. Raise your hand, and John has mics. We'll go mic by mic. I have a uh, three bedroom, one and a half bath in Gary, a uh, full basement, two car garage for twenty-five thousand. It does need a new roof and very minor cosmetic work on the inside. Anybody interested? Hit me up afterwards. I have, uh, I do have a uh, property under contract I'm trying to assign, which you can see, it's a $3.75. Uh, if I can't sign it, I'm looking for uh, my money. So, um, I'm asking uh, for sale to be avoided. Airbnb needs to be identified here. Whereas preferred homes, uh, always on the lookout for some deals to buy and fix and flip in the county. So uh, we're going to look for three to five homes to purchase. If there's any wholesalers in the room or people that have a, a distressed property in the county. Anyone else have a deal? My name is Marvin Cummings, I'm a licensed agent from Keller Williams in Illinois, Indiana. I just expanded over to Indiana, been doing very well in Illinois, and I'm actually looking for investors. So I'm trying to uh, take on new clients from Indiana, looking for a lot of rehab investors. Uh, I charge competitive um, commission. So if you're looking to do volume and looking for someone that's going to really push your properties and, and get them turned over fast. You exercise today too. We did these 90 day goals at the office, and these guys were like exercise, lose weight. So, like, this is good. I'm Bill with Green Axe. I've got a property uh, in Hessel that's a commercial piece. It's got an auto repair shop and apartment, and it's got a uh, um, old restaurant and a church with it. It doesn't look like much. Uh, and it's a 779 for it. It's got a $84,000. My name is Wayne Schaefer. I have an office in Highland, Indiana. I'm looking to pick up 20 houses between now and the end of the year. Um, so I also am looking for uh, wholesalers. Um, and uh, my, my sweet spot is the 90 uh, to 130,000 uh, ARV range. Anyone else? Wayne? Yeah, I'm John Kincock. He works for the largest wholesaler in Northwest Indiana. He has a few. And I've got three deals for you right now. Um, we've got two in Hammond, um, asking uh, 79900 move in or rent, uh, it's a double lot, 1500 square feet plus, five bedroom, two and a half bath, with a coach house that has a one bedroom, one bath, um, cash offers only. Our second Hammond property is uh, 49.9, renovated, uh, three bedroom, one bath, with an unfinished basement. Of Rick Ranch and ARV on that was 140, and the offers are due on October 19th at 12 p.m. And then we have a Chester the property, a little over 2,000 square feet, asking 158,750, four bedrooms, three baths. Um, it's a great fixer upper. Uh, two sits on two acres with a pole barn, and ARV on that one's about 280,000 cash offers only. So come see me if you guys are interested. All right, anyone else? Going once, going twice, 
sold, not to me. I struck out at this month's auction. There's this lady that kept bidding me up by a hundred bucks. Is she in here? It just drives me crazy. I just kept bidding. I went way over my max just to drive her up. But, um, real quick for membership. Um, benefits of being a member, the big thing is the website. Um, if you miss a meeting, the website has literally almost two years of recorded videos now of all our previous meetings. Um, we've had attorneys talking about rental law. We've had uh, guys who flip 50 houses a year talking about how they increase the value. Guys that do the burst strategy with rentals. Um, so we've had all sorts of different topics. That's all on the website. So you can go see all the videos there. Um, so if you want a membership, on the way out we have applications. You can talk to uh, Christy there. Um, she'll get you taken care of for that. Um, $90 for an individual, $135 for a couple or a partner. Uh, we also have corporate memberships as well. If you don't want to pay for a membership, you can just come month to month. It's $10. That helps cover the food. Um, apparently, I need to get more Jimmy John's um, pizzas next month. Um, speaking of next month, um, I'm really excited about this topic. Um, my company, we wholesale somewhere between 75 and 80 houses a year. So, and, and I used to be the sales guy before I hired John. John's doing a fantastic job. Um, being a sales guy, getting into properties, talking with you guys that are buying them, I would always hear the feedback. And the biggest thing that I got from that feedback was a lot of you guys, because you've never dealt with it, you don't know how to deal with it, and you're not able to make a buying decision just because of a lack of education. One of the biggest things I found is foundation issues. Who in here is scared of foundation issues? And you can raise your hand. I mean, I bought a house that had really bad walls. I was freaked out. I bought it so stupid low, I knew I was going to make money even if the foundation, I estimated like 30 grand. I'm like, I don't know what it's going to cost, but I'm going to put 30 grand into my budget, and if it comes in less, I'm going to be okay. Fortunately, I was able to get it done for $14,000. Um, so that house worked out a little bit. So um, last week I was with a guy in a house that I have this tiny, tiny crack. First time home buyers freaking out. So I had to go get it inspected. I didn't think I had to do anything. Steve's like, look, it's not that big of a deal, but I can't say it's not a big deal because the crack's there. So we put a couple of um, like microcarbon fiber strips or I don't know, whatever terminology you use. It was like 1200 bucks. You know, it took care of the inspection response. But I was chatting with him and I'm like, dude, there are people that have, you know, we see houses, big bowling walls, crack this, crack that, settling this. Can you teach us on, on how you take care of these problems? What's a big problem, what's not a big problem? Because a little hairline crack is not a big problem. Um, and can you give us a ballpark on what some of that's going to cost? So he's not going to be able to give you a pinpoint, hey, this costs A, B, and C. But he's going to be able to come in, he's going to teach the main problem and give you an idea if you have a wall that's bowing in, you know, per foot or whatever, you're going to be looking at spending between, I don't know, 15 and 20,000. If you have some settling in the garage and you need the mud jacket, you know, 500 to 1,000. So the whole idea with him talking next month is to give you guys more education so when you see an issue like that, it doesn't scare you. You're able to make a better decision and you can buy the house because right now, Houses are hard to find. So that's next month. We're going to be back here um, 6.30 to 8.30. If you want to be one of our spotlight speakers, um, reach out to me. And again, it's just a quick 8 to 10 minute presentation on a deal that you've done um, I don't know, sometime in the last six months that you think the group can learn from. So thanks again for coming. If you want to talk to Nathan and Katie, they're out back. Um, I'm going to go sign up all my kids for the Coverdale accounts. I actually learned a couple of things tonight on how I could use those small accounts to make make them money so I don't have to pay for their college out of pocket. Um, so they'll be there. We have the room till about 9.30. We don't have to pick up the chairs anymore. So finish up with the food since everybody's on a diet. Um, network, grab some cards, and we'll see you next month. Oh, okay. I'm just like a guy. Oh, okay. Okay.